Our next speaker is Professor Douglas Arner. Professor Arner is the Kelly Holdings Professor in Law of the University of Hong Kong. He's also the Associate Director of the HKUSCF FinTech Academy of Hong Kong U. Professor Arner is actually a pioneer in online FinTech education. He has over 80,000 learners from around the world under the edX Online Professional Certificate Program in FinTech. The discussion topics of Professor Arna today is building better financial systems, regulatory and supervisory technology in the wake of COVID-19. Professor Arna, the stage is yours. Thanks very much, Michael, and thanks for the invitation to uh uh, the Academy of Finance to be here, and congratulations on the launch. It's been uh, almost two years now, and I think off to uh, a really outstanding start, and great to see the development in the membership, in the programs, uh, and looking forward to seeing uh, what you all will be doing as we move forward. You know, I think when we look at this topic, and I think Arthur has done uh, a, a very good job in defining and looking at the vision and the context in Hong Kong, and essentially what I'm going to look at is what we are seeing globally in the context of both regulatory and supervisory technology, and in particular, the impact that we're seeing on some of these trends of COVID-19 and where we can look at things going forward. So I think globally, when we're thinking about this idea of regulatory and supervisory technology, we're thinking about use of technology for regulatory implementation, compliance, and monitoring. And we can see that by market participants, infrastructure providers, regulators, and supervisors. I think globally, if we are thinking about reg tech, we are increasingly looking at it not just in financial services, but across any regulated industry. Probably the biggest growth area for use of technology in a regulated industry today, health, health and travel where we have regulations and we are using technologies to enable compliance and monitoring of those requirements. This idea of soup tech. Soup tech is the use of technology by regulators and supervisors. And very often, it's two sides of the same coin when we're talking about reg tech. You know, something that I'm going to spend a fair amount of time talking about today is a big trend that we're seeing, and that is digital regulatory reporting. Now think about this for a second. From the standpoint of the industry, these are regulatory requirements to report regulatory requirements in a certain form, digitally. And so from the standpoint of the industry, implementing technologies to enable that digital reporting we can think of that as reg tech. How about from the supervisory side? Well, the supervisor is setting regulations which require digital reporting. The reporting, the data, the information that are taken in are then used subject to analytics, the basis of monitoring, enforcement actions and the like used for supervisory purposes. And so often when we think about reg tech and soup tech, they're actually two sides of the same coin depending on who is using it. And if we think about the industry, the providers, unlike when we think about FinTech, startups in RegTech are not the major industry players. We have an increasing range of startups, but your big industry players are, are the big four firms. Big tech firms like IBM Promontory, the big exchanges, if we think about the merger of LSE and Refinitiv, Part of the rationale of this was to better enable selling of reg tech services both to industry as well as supervisors. NASDAQ, as we're going to see, is actually one of the biggest providers both to industry as well as to regulators and supervisors. Amazon and other sorts of cloud players. These firms are increasingly, in addition to core sorts of cloud functions, also providing functions, a variety of regulatory and compliance structures. So if we think about the structure, you can think about startups. And if we think about startups, one of the biggest costs for a new entrant into the financial services sector, as you all know, 
is regulation and compliance. And as a result, any new startup is going to be looking at systems to reduce its costs. How can you apply technology to automate compliance functions to reduce costs? If we think about incumbents, incumbents have been the big drivers of reg tech. Why? Because over the past 10 years, we have seen an explosion in new regulations all over the world, which has driven over the past 20 years compliance to be the single biggest growth area of employment in global financial services. They have the budgets, they have the motivation, they're often the ones targeted by the fines. Big techs. As big techs enter into financial services, in the same way that they seek to apply a tech-first approach to automating their businesses, they're also seeking to apply a tech-first approach to dealing with regulatory and compliance uh, issues. Regulators and supervisors, both from the standpoint of collecting lots of data, supervisors collect, and over the past 10 years, there's been an explosion in the amount of data that supervisors collect. How can they better use tools from the standpoint of analyzing the data that they are collecting to better achieve their regulatory objectives? And of course, individuals. And we think about those regulatory objectives, we can think about efficiency. Basically, reg tech is one way, potentially, to bring down compliance costs. But as we're going to see, one of the most important aspects has been trying to reinforce financial stability through risk management or uh, analytics, particularly from the standpoint of macro prudential analytics, market integrity issues, sustainable development inclusion, innovation, and of course, competition. Many people, when they talk about reg tech, will focus on market integrity. And if we think about the past 10 years, AML, CFT has been one of the most rapidly growing areas. But as we turn to the longer history of use of technology for compliance and regulatory supervisory purposes, probably the driver over time has actually been reporting. Reporting in the context of uh, digital regulatory reporting for a variety of contexts and its use in monitoring and enforcement. Second, particularly since the 2008 global financial crisis, financial stability purposes. And if we think about the incredible growth in requirements for Basel II capital, Basel III, these sorts of frameworks and all of the reports they require, this has driven huge expenditures by industry, but also expenditures by supervisors in order to be able to build systems to analyze. Think about this for a second. A globally systemically important financial institution, a financial institution across borders designated as one of the most uh, significant globally, an institution like that will be filing every single day in the neighborhood of three to 5,000 reports, often using the same information collected from across its operations. And if we think of the information that is being provided to regulators, it requires a great deal of technology and investment from the standpoint of financial institutions in order to collect and package this information. And this is something uh, that is only set to increase. From the standpoint of sustainable development inclusion, as we begin developing more and more taxonomies, details about what must be included from the disclosure standpoint in order to meet an ever-increasing range of ESG requirements, technology is going to be core both to preparation of the information as well as analyzing the accuracy and sufficiency of that information. And of course, what we call tech risk. Tech risk has probably been, in the past two years, our most rapid growing area of compliance. First, data, data protection, data privacy, as an increasing range of jurisdictions have built increasingly prescriptive and sometimes conflicting requirements around data, its storage, and its use. And second, from the standpoint of cyber. I think that if we look at cyber today, this is identified by many financial institutions as 
their biggest financial risk. If we think about it from a regulatory standpoint, it's often identified as one of the biggest financial stability risks. And if we look at it from a national security side, it is often identified as one of the biggest national security risks. And at the same time, as we think about cyber and its challenges, the cyber attackers are developing very, very rapidly in their own uses of technology. One area where we are seeing this is in their own uses of automation, machine learning, and artificial intelligence to dramatically increase the number and sophistication of attack variants they use. And honestly, the only way to respond is a similar process of automation, machine learning, and AI from the standpoint of industry. We can think about this both from the standpoint of external as well as internal systems. I think as Arthur highlighted, this use of technology for regulatory compliance and supervisory purposes has a long history. And if we think about probably the greatest example that almost all of us are familiar with, think about the US SEC's Edgar system. This is a system that requires disclosure of all information under the various security laws in a certain format into a certain system. That system is then the basis of applications of a wide range of analytics by regulators for supervisory and enforcement purposes. It's also the basis of information that is used by markets. And in fact, it's the basis of information that many academics use for analyzing markets. That is a classic example of regulatory and supervisory technology, a system that mandates disclosure in a certain format set by the regulator, which then requires technology from the standpoint of the industry in order to comply with those requirements. That digitization, that creation of data, then enables a variety of analytics. Now, if we think of one of the highest profile examples of how this sort of system has been used, Certainly since the late 1980s in the United States, the single most common source of insider dealing investigations has come from the ticker tape. In other words, you think on one day a merger or acquisition is announced, and then you take six months data, back trading activity, and you subject that trading activity data to various analytics compared to known lists of insiders and their families to look for trades that merit further investigation. You then begin investigating individual trades by those insiders to seek to identify whether or not any unauthorized trading has taken place. That is reg tech and soup tech. To the extent that by 2016, FINRA in the United States estimated that it had real time data on 100% of equity trades, 90% of commodities trades, and 70% of debt trades in the United States. And it was using that data, not just from the standpoint of structured data analytics, but also from the standpoint of big data structures, using outside sources of data to compare to information in that database from the standpoint of monitoring behavior in the industry. Now, if we think of the second biggest area where we've seen growth, it's really been in risk management. We think about the earliest hiring sprees in the financial services industry of astrophysicists and computer scientists. It comes in the 1990s in the context of VAR modeling, value at risk, Monte Carlo simulations, and the like, which required heavy investments in technology in order to be able to model. And we can think about these being reflected in regulatory approaches. An amendment in 1997 and 1998 to the original Basel I Capital Accord called the Market Risk Amendment, basically allowing financial institutions to set their own market risk capital requirements on the basis of internal modeling techniques. If we think about the Basel II Capital Accord coming after the Asian financial crisis, at the heart of the Basel II Capital Accord, are not only standardized structures, but also models-based structures, usable not only in market risk, 
but also in credit risk and a range of other risks. And essentially, those systems were reg tech. They were financial institutions using technology to build capital requirements, which were then reviewed from the standpoint of supervisors. Now, if we think about the last decade, we've seen a very dramatic change in global financial services in the aftermath of the 2008 global financial crisis. And if we think of that crisis and its impact on the standpoint of, of use of regulatory and supervisory technology, I think we can look at this from a couple of different angles. The first is really around the crisis itself. But that crisis, in addition to changing the way that we looked at finance, also led to a dramatic increase in regulatory requirements. And something that we see globally today is that any time a new regulatory requirement comes into place, financial institutions will immediately be looking at how can they build IT systems in order to enable compliance with that regulation. And as a result, over the past 10 years, this explosion in new regulatory reporting requirements has led to a consequent explosion in the numbers of compliance personnel in financial institutions, but also explosion in the spending on compliance technologies within financial institutions. And I think the third is really this idea of technology. And of course, one of the biggest aspects of technology over the past 10 years is realizing that technology and finance have always been co-developmental. But the last 10 years saw a major acceleration. Why? Because over the past 10 years, the financial services industry has become almost entirely a digital industry. As a digital industry, that means that the data are there to subject to analytics of a variety of increasing forms. And as a result of that digitization, as well as the application of a range of new technologies, we've seen new entrants, but in particular, we've seen big changes in speed of development. And these have posed big challenges from a regulatory standpoint. And my colleagues and I looked at this in detail uh, in a study that was published in 2019, looking at global trends uh, in regulatory and supervisory technology. And I think coming out of our analysis was a view that RegTech is something that is not just about efficiency, but from the standpoint of regulators, supervisors, and policymakers, it's actually about building new and better processes. And I'm gonna talk about how we're seeing this happening. Now, if we look at regulation, over the past decade in the aftermath of the 2008 crisis, I think we can see this really coming from uh, five different areas. The first, obviously, post-crisis regulatory changes. And one of my favorite examples comes from uh, the United States in the context of implementation of Basel III liquidity uh, requirements. There's a form. That form is approximately 125 pages long the US Congressional Budget Office estimates that that form should take over 100 hours to complete. That form must be filed every day by systemically important banks on a T plus one basis. The only way that that data can be compiled and put into that form in order to meet that requirement is the use of technology. And in fact, what we've seen, and it's something that is, we've all seen uh, highlighted in the past several weeks in the context of India, where so much of financial sector, IT, compliance, and even risk management has often been centralized in India or Malaysia, the Philippines, Poland, Utah, a few other places, is that it has been necessary from the standpoint of the financial services industry to build systems that are capable of collecting data on a global basis in order to repackage it and deliver that 
to multiple regulators around the world. Perhaps the best example of this is something that is called BCBS 239. What is BCBS 239? This is Publication 239 of the Basel Committee on Banking Supervision. What is it about? It's called Risk Data Aggregation. Risk Data Aggregation says that a financial institution is expected to be able to give an aggregate picture of its global risk profile on essentially a T plus one basis and report that to regulators. And that has driven a massive amount of expenditure by financial services in order to be able to comply with this. As I'm gonna highlight in a few minutes, there's still a long way to go. But these post-crisis regulatory changes, as well as BCBS 239, have also resulted in banking regulators in particular inundated with vast amounts of information that they have then had to figure out what to do with. And as a result, there's an increasing focus on thinking about those disclosure and reporting requirements, how the information can be reported in a digitally structured manner, which is then more subject to analytics from the standpoint of the supervisors. That's regulatory and supervisory technology. AML. AML has been one of those areas that has been a long-term focus of technology, but I think the real dramatic increase in this came in 2011, 2012, with massive fines coming out of the United States against a number of global financial institutions. We saw last year uh, the leakage of what are called the FinCEN papers, and it's interesting that if we look at those FinCEN papers, uh, essentially these are suspicious transaction reports filed with uh, the money laundering regulator in the United States, in the US Treasury Department. Those reports in 2011, 2012, numbered about 200,000 a year. That's a lot, that's a lot of suspicious transaction reports. After those big fines in 2012, the numbers of suspicious transaction reports shot up to over 2 million suspicious transaction reports every year. And that, I think, shows you the basis of this explosion in AML compliance, as well as in technology spending in financial services. And if we think about many of those AML settlements, not only did they have large fines, but they often came with requirements for the financial institution to build global systems that were capable of delivering information on customers across the global operations of the firm to an external monitor on a T plus one basis. Once again, if you have millions of customers in dozens of countries, the only way that you can do this is centralization and automation of your customer analytics functions to be able to not only collect this information, but also to be able to deliver it. But I think finally, particularly in the EU, but also elsewhere, some words that in 2016, almost none of us here in Hong Kong had ever heard of, MIFID II and GDPR. By 2017, everyone in Hong Kong knew about MIFID II and GDPR. Essentially, what are these? These are requirements, particularly in MIFID II, for transparency post-crisis transparency, but essentially what it requires is real-time reporting of every transaction involving an EU-listed security. And I think it's what is interesting is if we look at 2019, 2020, we see a series of enforcement actions uh, from the UK and European regulators against major financial institutions for failures to report under the requirements of MIFID and MIFID II. What would we often see? We would see financial institutions reporting erroneously, failing to report tens of millions of transactions over a two-year period. The only way that you can report tens of millions of transactions is automating the compliance process. And if you are the supervisor, the only way you can analyze this data is by automating your analytics. Data protection regulation, payment services, and all tied together by ID. 
And I summarize it all in this slide. By the end of 2019, the financial services industry globally had paid over $300 billion in fines. At the end of 2019, approximate global financial sector IT spending was $300 billion a year. And at the end of 2019, over $300 billion a year was being spent on compliance. And as a result, we can see that before COVID, there had already been this massive drive, particularly across the industry, to digitize its systems in order to reduce fines, comply with regulatory requirements, and from the standpoint of regulator, regulators and supervisors to be able to use the data that they were driving in. Now, if we think about COVID-19, this has only driven it forward. And I think one can highlight four areas where we see this most significantly. RegTech and SubTech, particularly around digital reporting. AML and market integrity, particularly around development of centralized governmental databases, whether of identity or beneficial ownership, which can then be used uh, as a different way of implementing these systems. Electronic payments, of course, but developments around central bank digital currencies and a, an important objective of central bank digital currencies is information collecting. And that makes them a form of supervisory technology. And of course, concentrations and use of data. Now, just to conclude, if I'm thinking of where are our biggest trends. 2020, the Financial Stability Board produced a major report looking at RegTech uh, and SoupTech. And in that report, we see a tremendous amount of focus on RegTech and SoupTech, but in particular around digital regulatory reporting requirements. And if we look at major jurisdictions around the world, we are seeing an ever-increasing focus on how one can digitize their processes. In other words, if you are a supervisor or a regulator, as you think about reporting requirements, you want the data that come in to be digitized and structured so that you can more easily use it from the standpoint of analytics and enforcement in order to better achieve your regulatory objectives. What this means is thinking whenever one is creating a new rule, a new requirement about the nature of the reporting so that the industry is then responding from the standpoint of its own use of technology for regulatory compliance more to the requirements of the regulators in terms of digitization as opposed to necessarily their own methods. And I think if we are thinking about probably where our greatest development is likely to take place over the coming decade, it is going to be in all aspects of digitizing regulatory reporting. This will enable in some cases automation by the financial services industry, but not in every case. But it will invariably enable better collection of data, better use of data for analytics by regulators and supervisors. We're already seeing a trend that when supervisors bring in data and they realize that they're missing a data element, what do they do? Well, they simply request disclosure reporting of that piece of data that they need in order to address their modeling and structural frameworks. So I think if we are thinking forward, the past year of COVID-19 has probably driven these discussions ahead more in one year than many of us would have anticipated happening over three, five, 10 years. Why? Because in much of the world, the financial services industry has spent the last year working from home. That means that compliance staffs have been non-face-to-face -face out of the office, supervising trading staffs who are non-face-to-face -face out of the office, dealing with customers who are non-face-to-face, -face, and regulators 
have been out of the office, dealing not only with each other, but dealing with the industry on a non-face-to-face -face basis. All of this has driven an increasing level of comfort by regulators and the industry with these sorts of non-face-to-face digital approaches, and we are seeing that reflected in aspects of digital reporting, analytics, new approaches to AML, as well as use for enforcement purposes. So, just to close today, if I wanted to highlight the areas where I think we're going to see the biggest developments in compliance going forward, and as a result also in reg tech and soup tech, the first of those is cybersecurity. The second is around data protection. The third is very much around sustainability and related stress testing, reporting, and disclosure frameworks. And the fourth is actually around digital assets to the extent that we can use technology to better police digital asset markets. That provides the foundation for future normalization and growth. Thank you all very much. Thank you very much, Professor Anna. Uh, thank you. you. You've given us a very comprehensive and holistic review of the whole um, uh, history of this very important subject matter. I can see, uh, unfortunately, we don't have much time, but I can see we still have time for at least one very mm -hmm. important question just asked by uh, some audience. Is that uh, what sort of trends do you see in enforcing actions and in the rag tag? and soup tank? I think yeah. it's a very fair question. Thank you for that. And I think it's a really interesting one because uh, we've seen some real changes here. And I mentioned first the series of enforcement actions out of the Financial Conduct Authority around essentially reporting requirements. But what we also saw embedded in those enforcement actions was not only a penalty, but also a requirement that the financial institution builds systems to enable it to comply properly with the requirements going forward. In other words, the regulator, as part of the enforcement action, is mandating a reg tech response from the financial institution <laughs> in order to be able to comply with those soup tech digital regulatory reporting requirements. The other, and I think this really highlights it, October last year, Citibank had a 400 million US dollar settlement with the US regulators. Part of that uh, was uh, we saw a change of chief executive, we're seeing a change of direction. But what was the key aspect? It was failures in the context of risk data aggregation. 12 years after 2008, 12 years after Citi's bailout by the US government, City still did not have systems in place that enabled risk data aggregation and reporting. So what that settlement has required is that City build systems to be able to comply with these risk data aggregation requirements. And I think what that highlights is that not only this trend towards greater use of digital from the standpoint of regulators and supervisors, but also from the standpoint of enforcement and compliance that they are now enforcing building of IT systems by major financial institutions in order to comply with those systems. Thank you, Professor. I think we still have time for one more question. Mm. Right? Um, the question is, when we talked about digital ID, how does this differ between entities and individuals? Yeah, you know, when it's something that in the AML context, uh, lots of work is being done all over the world uh, on sovereign digital identity systems. And we're seeing that often at the basis uh, of market integrity is the need to uh, identify your customer. And a sovereign digital ID is really the simplest uh, and most robust structure on which to grow on. But where a lot of work is being done now is in the context of digital identification of entities. In other words, that if you are dealing with a firm, uh, a business, how do you go about identifying it? And of course, if we think about 
the fact that from the standpoint of data with many companies registry, the information is declarative. It's just deposited by whoever is establishing the company, and no one ever checks that to see if it's actually accurate. And so what that means is that you can't really depend on it from the standpoint uh, of uh, an AML or a market integrity standpoint. And this has been one of our biggest costs from the standpoint of doing business, particularly with small and medium-sized enterprises on a cross-border basis. And so increasing amounts of effort are going into thinking about how can we build systems, structures that enable better identification of entities and their owners and managements in order not only to uh, better achieve market integrity objectives, but also reduce costs of doing business with these smaller companies, which at the end of the day are the basis of growth development and employment going forward. Great. Thank you very much, Professor. Thank you very much for sharing with us.